My name is Susan Gilbert, and today is my coming out party, as Evan Carmichael, my friend and colleague, is calling it. I am willing to be seen. I am willing to show up and be a messenger. And my mission is to help people get their voice, their message, their knowledge, their wisdom out into the world. You know, some people who are watching this video right now know a little bit about me. Very few people know a lot about me or everything about me because I'm somebody who loves being behind the scenes. As the metaphor, the wind beneath somebody's wings, that's me. I love to elevate support and help other people with their message. But me, my business has been mostly referral for almost 15, 20 years, depends upon where we take it back since my first book was published in 2001. I wanna take just a few minutes and let you get to know me, be a little vulnerable with you. And if you can stay with me for just a few minutes, then you'll have an understanding of what Messengers on a Mission is all about, what my mission is, and perhaps your own vision for your mission will start to unfold. You know, as a child, we would look back and call me an HSI, although we didn't even have those terms back then, but I was really sensitive. And I could see things as most children do, we call them our imaginary friends. But you know, it was dismissed as my childhood imagination. Yet when it came to me being able to hold books in my hands, I checked out my maximum amount from the bookmobile. I would walk down the hill from the house that I lived in in a small town, Pennsylvania. That bookmobile would show up once a week and I would take as many as I could check out and carry back up the hill again. And I would crawl underneath my mother's desktop style sewing machine or her cedar closet and read. It was like I went into my own little imaginary world where I lived vicariously through the books. As a teenager, I locked myself in my bedroom for privacy to read. And at school, I was seen as quiet and studious, always with my nose in a book because I just loved to learn. And I loved this inner world that I created where I could be anything, I could do anything, I could go anywhere through books. Now it turns out by the time I was in 10th grade, I had enough credits to graduate from high school because I never took a study hall. I was just always, again, my studious self. And a guidance counselor called me into his office and I thought, oh, wow, what have I done something wrong? And as I sat down, he's smiling and he says, Susan, um, what college have you thought about going to and what would you like to major in? I have college. Um, I don't think my family has plans for that. I don't think they have the money for that. And he said, oh, don't worry about that. You, you'll qualify for a scholarship. Take these papers home with you, give them to your family, and then come back to see me. Well, I was just on the moon, like more learning, more, more time in, in the studious world that I lived in. And when I got home and I presented the paperwork to my mother and father, my dad said, girls don't go to college. They get married and have a family. So you know what? That's what I did. I married my first sweetheart. Um, he returned home safely from Vietnam and we had a plan. He knew how important this was for me. So the plan was he would go to college first and then it would be my turn. However, as plans sometimes don't turn out the way that we think they will, he was diagnosed with acute myelogenous leukemia when he was only 28, I was 25. And my mother almost simultaneously was diagnosed with cancer of the liver. It was actually cancer of the colon that had spread to her liver. And in the space of one year that both diagnosis and both had passed, and I was known as the young widow at the age of 25. Going back to before his illness, there was a little bookstore in, again, the small town that I grew up in, 
And my husband, who was a state police officer at the time, he lovingly called me his hippie wife because I would visit this small bookstore and we held, it was groups for meditation and reading Edgar Cayce and dream interpretation and chakras. And that was my gateway to metaphysics, which still continues today. While I lost the two people that I was closest to, and that I love so dearly. And oh, by the way, my husband was three credits away from graduating from college when he passed away. So I found myself right back to the very beginning again. But I knew in my heart, I knew that there was more for me. And I knew that I couldn't afford to pay for the expensive Penn State extension college credits, although I did take one course. It was a... Um, writing course, uh, an essay course, uh, which again fits so much when we look back at our lives and we see how everything has come together. So that English class, and I was encouraged to do more, but I couldn't afford to do that. So I remember hearing when my husband was stationed in Southern California to finish up his tour of duty at El Toro, um, Santa Ana, California, that if you establish residency in California, that you could within six months go to a state college. And so I took one step, one very big step from small town Pennsylvania to Southern California. And I went back to my maiden name, Gilbert. My married name was Grotenthaler, that's a mouthful. But going back to my maiden name was also a way for me to create a new identity, to reinvent myself to see my life moving forward and not what had happened to me in my past. While I was establishing residency, I went to a weekend college, kind of learn what your aptitudes are, what you would do well at, so that when I was going to school that I could major in what would support me and what I do best. (laughs) What I was told was that I would make a good attorney because I had good communication skills, And I would um, do good as an architect to do very well that way because I had good 3D spatial understanding. And all I could think about was I just need to get my college degree not extended past that. I was ready to get going on my new life path. And there was a woman who there wasn't a very interactive weekend, but there was a woman who kind of walked with me to my car and said, have you ever thought of sales? And all I could think about was sleazy polyester, used car salesman, no, no slime. I don't want to be a salesman. But she gave me her husband's business card because she said he'd opened up a store, was uh, had filled out his, his sales staff, but had one opening because he really wanted a woman to complete his staff. And, he, and she thought that I would be that person. Well, her name was Patty. Her husband's name was Jake. And I drove around in my car for a while with that business card in the side pocket till finally I pulled it out, called Jake. And he said, oh yeah, Patty told me all about you. I'm looking forward to meeting you. Now that's synchronicity. That's what happens when you're open to new opportunities and you are aligned with your mission in the world. I met with Jake. It was a Radio Shack store. We were selling TRS-80, they call them now Trash-80 computers, but they were the predecessor to the IBM PC. Jake and Patty were right. I was a natural. I was a problem solver. So I could look at what problem the person was trying to solve and then give them the how-tos on using the computer, even though I didn't know how it worked, didn't understand the inner workings of it, but I could see the solutions that were available. And of course, it's solutions that people want, isn't it? So when the IBM PC came out, I was positioned perfectly as somebody who understood the microcomputer market. And I rode that wave. I did very, very well with that to the point that AT&T recruited me to head up their national data sales organization. And I'll tell you that lack of no college education which I'd never gotten, just got pushed right off my shoulder to be able to bring, be brought in to an organization like AT&T 
And yet the men that I worked for prior to that, that I'd had all these successes with in selling the IBM PC and add-ons and training and services, said, Susan, you're an entrepreneur. We understand why you want to go to AT&T, but you know, you always have a place back with us again. They were right. I, I didn't succeed there. I felt like my wings got clipped in, a, in a, a corporate environment because we entrepreneurs, we're nimble, we're agile, we move and flow where we see the opportunity and where the solutions lie. And I wasn't able to do that. But I didn't want to go backwards because I'm a forward thinking person. So I was running marathons, very unhappy when I would go into these early morning meetings at uh, at and having run 10 miles, eight miles, whatever the, the amount was. And they'd have these greasy donuts. And I was like, oh, what I wouldn't give for a good brand muffin. So once again, I went out into the unknown, had never worked in a restaurant and never worked in a bakery, but I opened up a bakery cafe chain called Little Miss Muffins, selling healthy muffins and coffee. Now, Coffee was not a well thought of. I mean, it was just a beverage that you drank in the morning. It wasn't a, It wasn't what we think of coffee as today. And I would fly up to Seattle to meet with Starbucks and Seattle's Best because nobody knew who they were yet. They had not gone nationwide, but I was looking at what they were doing and wanting to implement some of those flavored coffees, espressos, cappuccinos, and uh, Little Miss Muffins. And I grew Little Miss Muffins from two locations to five locations. It was within two years, I had five locations. And uh, several of those were located in Bilbao Park, a very prestigious and lovely place if you're ever in San Diego. And I was the only person that was a private vendor that was there. So um, in fact, there's still one there today in the Casa de Prada building where the Museum of Photographic Arts is located. So having arrived at that place of success as a local business person in San Diego where people knew me. I had people who I had sold hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of computer equipment in come into the bakery and buy an 89 cent muffin from me, but they saw me, I was living my dream. I was doing something that I felt had a purpose in the world. I was giving people, I actually had calorie counts and nutritional counts. And again, this was before, this is a 1980, 1986. You didn't see that type of thing. Um, but that's what we as entrepreneurs do. We're forward thinking, we're getting our information out. And I was on a mission then for people to be able to eat healthy food. So fast forward to, I sold the main commissary, had just the outline locations that I would buy the muffins from the, the person who purchased the commissary. And then I let some leases go. I was down to two locations in Belleville Park and it, I just wasn't that busy. I went from working almost nonstop because the bakery would bake the muffins at night and then we would have the locations open during the day and I would go visit all the locations. I had 55 employees. Um, but now it was like it was on autopilot almost. I mean, I would go in, I'd say hello. I would spend some time with my staff, um, take care of the paperwork. But I started writing again, going back to that passion, going back to my reading. And I will tell you that the little Craftsman bungalow that I lived in in San Diego was filled to the brim with books. And I've collected children's books for years and years. Beatrix Potter, uh, my first editions of Little Women. This cherishing of books and this cherishing of reading and this cherishing of um, how books live on forever really propelled me into wanting to learn the craft of writing. And I tried memoir, writing my story, people would say to, to me, how did you do that? How, did, how did, have you arrived where you are from where you came from? And so I tried memoir, and then I tried uh, nonfiction, and then I tried fiction, and it just wasn't coming together for me until I got the message returning from a really high energy conference. It was called the Awakened World Conference in Palm Springs. Dr. Michael Beckwith was there, and um, Barbara Marks Hubbard, Jean Houston. I mean, you can imagine what that was like. And on, in the car, driving home, I got the message. And the message is, I don't have the book here, but it's the land of I can, an adventure in life. And it came out very similar to the books that I read, which is distilled down to its very essence. It's only 52 pages, but that's all you need. 
So now people are once again asking me, how did you do that? In amongst this time, also after I had sold the main location, the commissary, I had been reading Richard Bach's books and living vicariously through him and having the desire for flight. So I got my pilot's license. I learned to fly. That's a whole, we'll, I'll do a video on that alone because the experience of flight when you're in the air by yourself completely, it's within your hands and your ability to be able to get that plane back on the ground where you started again is just so empowering. And it came from books. So once again, the idea of books over and over and over have, have come to me. And um, I consider Richard Bach a messenger because he gave me, even though his books are fiction, he gave me the desire to fly. The Land of I Can was more successful than I ever thought was possible. It was just something that my heart was calling for me to do. I knew it was my message out into the world. And when I wrote it, I thought women will buy this book for themselves and they will buy it for other women and gift it to them. And that did happen. A woman purchased, I had the, the books in Barnes and Noble and like all the different, we have so many bookstores that we don't have anymore, but I had it in gift shops because it's a gift book. It was in Hallmark stores. So I don't know where this seed book was purchased, but somebody purchased a copy of The Land of Ikean, a woman, and gave it to another woman, Elaine Fink, who is the executive director of the Leadership Academy for the San Diego Unified School District, where there was 250 schools. And she knew that the she would be guiding the school district through a lot of changes. And the land of I can really is about navigating change, something that I learned very young. So they purchased 250 copies of the book and said, can you get them to our office by this date? And I said, absolutely. Um, and I asked why, and they told me that they would be using it for this first in-house conference, which really was so amazing to me. But it got even better because those principals took the books back into the school districts, into their schools. And I started getting orders from the individual schools. And when I asked them, why, how are you using these books? Their answer was, we're using it for character development in the elementary schools. At that point, had I passed, I would have felt that I had fulfilled my legacy to leave a book that is dust jack, jacket embossed, hardcover, cloth, four color interior, a book that will stand the test of time. I felt that I could have left at that point, but I didn't because I have so much more to do. And that's what this channel is about. I'm coming out because there's a new me. I'm coming out from breaking out of the shell. I want to show the world that there's so much more to me and that there's no, nothing to fear in, to be in front of the camera. I love talking with people. So these interviews and clips from interviews that you will see here on the Messengers on a Mission channel is for me to let the world know and to, to show that there are messengers, whether I've worked with those messengers or they're messengers in the world that have gotten their work out into the hands and hearts of the people that they want to impact. And that the process that I've developed to help other people discover what I call their golden book idea so that they can write, publish and promote the book that they'll be remembered for their greatest contribution. If that's of interest to you, well, I'm your gal. So if you would like to work with a guide who has helped other successful entrepreneurs to get their message into the hands and hearts of the people that they want to impact, please reach out to me because life is short, but a book lasts forever.